In this video, we're talking about periodic trends, and we're going to use Coulomb's Law to explain why those periodic trends occur the way that they do. Now, one quick thing I want to mention before we get into this. On the AP Chemistry test, you can't use the trend to explain the trend. Here's an example of what I mean by that. If you had to ask the question, why does chlorine have a larger atomic radius than fluorine? A bad answer would be, as you go down the column on the periodic table, the atomic radius increases, so chlorine has a larger atomic radius. You, that was basically just says that chlorine has a larger atomic radius because chlorine has a larger atomic radius. It doesn't really explain why anything is true. A better answer is written down below here. It says chlorine's valence electrons are in the 3p orbitals, which are high in quanti higher quantum level than fluorine's 2p valence electrons. Since chlorine's 3p electrons are farther from the nucleus, it has a larger atomic radius. That's a better answer because it's using Coulomb's law and energy levels um, distance from the nucleus to explain um, why chlorine has a larger atomic radius. So we need to use Coulomb's law to explain the trend. You can't use a trend to explain a trend. One additional thing with that, the octet rule is a trend. This idea that atoms are most stable if they've got eight valence electrons. Again, that's just a trend. It doesn't explain anything else. And so you can't use the octet rule in our explanations here for explaining a trend. So let's get into it. Um, the first thing that we need to know is Coulomb's law. Force, the attractive force or repelling force equals K, that's just a constant, times charge number one, times charge number two, divided by R squared, R being the distance between um, the proton and the electron in this case. We're also gonna look in energy levels. And so a good way to think about that is an electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, etc. Those big numbers, that is the energy level or electron shell. So these two electrons, are in the one energy level. These eight electrons are in the two energy level and so forth. So we're gonna look at those energy levels as well. So let's look at a few examples here. Um, I've got three atoms that I'm gonna draw. Um, I've got uh, hydrogen here with one proton. We've got helium with two protons and two neutrons. And then we've got a lithium atom with three protons and then four neutrons there. So we've got three nuclei of those three atoms. And our first example here I wanna look at is the hydrogen. And so hydrogen has one electron. And so I'm using a Bohr model of the atom. We know this isn't really accurate of what, you know, the electron's not orbiting. That's not really going on, but it's a good way for us to think about um, this. And it's hard to draw a quantum mechanical representation. So I'm gonna see what this kind of Bohr model. Um, over here then, this is gonna have two electrons in and helium. Um, now those two electrons are actually going to be pulled a little bit closer because now instead of having Q1 equals 1, we're going to have Q1 equals 2. We've got two protons protons to pull on those electrons. So I'm going to draw those in a little bit closer and you see we have a smaller atom there. Now over here we've got um, lithium. So let's take a look at lithium. Um, lithium is going to have three electrons. Now those first two are going to be in the 2s orbital and the, or sorry, the 1s orbital this energy level of one. And then the next electron is gonna be in the 2s, it's at a higher energy level. And so those are gonna fill um, in, a, in a wider um, orbital. And so you see lithium actually is a bigger atom than these other two. Now it has three um, protons, so it's pulling things closer, um, but it's got that additional energy level, meaning that it's overall larger. Um, as we go through this, um, we want to keep the periodic table in mind. Um, this is kind of one of our, these are our three friends, right? Um, Coulomb's Law, Energy Levels, and the Periodic Table. And so we're going to keep this in mind. Um, now, as we go from this first one, from hydrogen to helium, um, it's kind of like we're moving across the row, hydrogen to helium, or the trends I say will apply to like lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, you know, et cetera. And then wherever we go from um, helium to lithium, that's kind of like we're moving down the column. So we were up here, now we're moving down to lithium, to sodium, potassium, and so forth. So anything I say about these two, we're thinking we're moving down um, a group, down a column. Anything I say here, um, we're moving across a period. So I'll label that on the diagram there, moving across, moving down, as I use those three examples. Now the things I say may or may not actually apply to these three atoms, but they're going to apply as trends to the atoms in general on the periodic table. 
So the first thing I want to look at is something called effective nuclear charge, which actually isn't a trend per se. It's something that we'll use to explain the trends. Effective nuclear charge um, is kind of just saying, like, what is the Q value for each of these? Now, it may be a little bit different than you think um, once we get to lithium. So this first one, the effective nuclear charge, or ZF, is 1. We've got one proton. Here, uh, the effective nuclear charge is 2. We've got two protons pulling. See, this is feeling the, 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 the pull from both of those protons, so effective nuclear charge of 2. Once we get to lithium, though, you might expect, expect it to be 3, but the effective nuclear charge isn't 3, it's just 1. Here's why. There are three protons pulling on that electron, but there are two inner electrons or core electrons that are actually repelling this one valence electron. So the effective nuclear charge on this electron right here is only one. And we get that by taking three protons minus the two repelling electrons to get effective nuclear charge of one. Now this effective nuclear charge will match the columns on the periodic table. So the first group has effective nuclear charge of one, this group two. If you slide over here to, to group 3A, um, it's got effective nuclear charge of three, and then four, and then five, and then six, and seven. So effective nuclear charge, though, we can use in our reasoning. It's a good term to use in a free response. We can say as the effective nuclear charge increases, like from one to two here, then the size of the atom um, decreases, assuming we stay on that same energy level. That effect that I just described is called the shielding effect. That's the effect of these core electrons repelling, um, diminishing the effect of the protons kind of in the middle there. So that's called the shielding effect. So we can use these ideas to help explain these trends. All right, let's jump into our first actual trend here. Electronegativity, probably the one you're most familiar with. Um, and this is just how much an atom attracts electrons in a bond. Um, is how we determine if there's a covalent bond or a polar covalent or an ionic bond. And a, a, a way to kind of think about this, don't write this, but a way to think about this is how much does this atom want electrons, right? It doesn't have, really have feelings, but it's a good way for us to kind of think about it, but not a good way to, to write it out and explain it that way. So with electronegativity, let's think about it. If we go across the periodic table, we've got one proton, then we go to two protons, well, these two protons are going to have a greater pull on electrons, and so this would have a greater electronegativity. That's why as we move to the right on the periodic table, the electronegativity increases. Those We have more protons, therefore more effective nuclear charge, therefore the um, atom is more attracting to electrons. Now as we move down from hydrogen to lithium to sodium and so forth, um, we're jumping up energy levels. And so... This one right here, even though it's got um, more protons, well, that doesn't really matter as much. It's effective nuclear charge is just one, and these outer electrons are farther away. In other words, R, the distance is greater. And if that distance is greater, then that force must be less. There's an inverse relationship between the two. And so as we move down the periodic table, the electronegativity um, decreases. And so here's our trend overall. Electronegativity increases as you up and to the right, but again, that's not enough to know that. You need to be able to say that as you move to the right, the effective nuclear charge increases, therefore electronegativity increases. As you move up, you're decreasing the number of energy levels, so those electrons are closer, therefore the electronegativity increases. You need to be able to say all of that in a free response question. Let's look at our next um, trend, and that's ionization energy. This is the energy needed to remove an electron. It takes energy to do that. Um, so let's take a look at this. Um, here we've got hydrogen. And let's compare that to helium. Well, helium's got two um, protons pulling on the electrons. So you can imagine it would be harder to yank one of those electrons out because the protons are pulling more because you've got two of them. Um, and that kind of goes back to Coulomb's law, right? Like we've got two charges. So we've got a greater effective nuclear charge. Therefore, it's harder to remove or it takes more energy to remove that electron. So as you go across, the ionization energy increases. As you go down, the ionization energy should um, decrease. Same thing as electronegativity. Um, as these move farther away, the attractive force is less, um, the attractive force from the nucleus, and therefore it takes less energy to remove them. Francium is you know, very reactive. It's easy to take an electron from francium because it's at such, they're at such, so far from the nucleus. So that's our trend overall there. 
Now, there's one more thing we need to look about with ionization energy, and that's this, that an atom doesn't just have one ionization energy. Atoms can have as many ionization energies as they have electrons, because you can keep removing them if you have enough energy um, being put in. So let's take a look at magnesium. Um, this is a good example to start with. Um, magnesium here has 12 electrons. If we remove one electron, I looked this up, if we remove one electron, that takes 737.7, I believe it's joules of energy to remove, remove uh, you know, a mole of electrons. Um, so we remove one electron, it takes that much energy. And that would give us 11 electrons. Th those, that next electron that we want to remove for ionization energy too, is still in that third energy level there. So let's see how much that would be. That would be 1,450. Now that looks like a huge jump. I'd say it's a small jump once we see the third jump here. It takes a little bit more energy to remove another electron. Now once we remove two, we've gone to 11, and now we're at 10. Well, the next electron that we want to remove is now in the two energy level. It's much closer to the nucleus. If it's much closer to the nucleus, the force that it's being pulled by the nucleus with is much greater. And so now the third ionization energy is going to be much, much greater. Let's take a look and let's see what that is. 7,732. It's like, I don't know, five times greater or so than ionization energy two was. The reason that's so much greater is because now we've jumped down to that second energy level. So whenever you, if you ever see a table where you've got these ionization energies, look for the big jump. Wherever that big jump is, that tells you whenever it jumped from one energy level to the next. Um, so if you had this data, you should be able to identify like, okay, that, so there's our ionization energy, there's a little bit more, there's the big jump as the third one. Well, you know, that's gotta be either beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, or, or, and so forth. Because one, two, and then boom, now we're pulling from a third or a, a previous energy level. Next, let's look at electron affinity. Electron affinity is kind of the opposite of ionization energy. Instead of ionization energy is the energy it takes to remove an electron. Electron affinity is energy that's released whenever it gets an electron. Affinity just means you, you like something, you like to be around it. So electron affinity, we can kind of think about it like electronegativity as well. And so, for example, if we move across the periodic table, um, helium is an example, we've got two um, protons. So normally it would release more energy if you add an electron to it compared to um, hydrogen. Now, helium is kind of an exception. It's a noble gas, so that doesn't really apply. And that's because if you add an electron to helium, you're adding it to a higher energy level. So maybe a better example um, would be fluorine. You know, fluorine wants to gain an electron because it's got a lot of protons. It's got a high effective nuclear charge, effective nuclear charge of seven. So whenever it gains an electron, there's a large amount of energy that gets released. Um, so fluorine would be the would have the greatest electron affinity. And so just like the electronegativity, as you move up the periodic table and you move to the right on the periodic table, the electron affinity is increasing. And again, that's because as you move up, there's lower and lower energy levels, and therefore um, that attraction is greater. And as if you move to the right, you've got more and more protons, a higher effective nuclear charge, and therefore there's more attraction. So therefore greater electron affinity. Next, let's take a look at atomic radius. That's just the size of the atom. Um, and so for this, um, the trend will be as we move, uh, let's just take a look at the example here. Um, as I go from here to here, we've kind of already talked about this, but I've got more protons. We've got more protons, that's a greater effective nuclear charge, greater charge which is gonna have a greater force and it's gonna pull those electrons in closer. So as we move to the right, the atomic radius gets smaller, or I could say, as I move to the left, the atomic radius gets bigger. And then as I move down, um, we see this lithi lithium atom does get larger than the helium, and that's because we're adding to a higher energy level, um, and therefore that atom is getting bigger. So we can use both of those concepts to explain atomic radius. Next, let's look at ionic radius. This is a little bit trickier. For this one, I want to look at three specific, or one specific example, and that's going to be comparing fluoride, neon, and um, sodium ions. So let's start with neon as kind of our middle ground, and then we'll take a look at sodium. Now, all three of these have something in common. They all have the same number of um, electrons. So let's take a look. Sodium, 
elemental sodium would have 11 electrons, 11 protons. But if it's sodium plus, that means it's lost one electron. It now has 10 electrons. Still 11 protons, but 10 electrons. Neon has 10 electrons and protons. And then fluoride, well, elemental fluorine would have nine electrons, but with the negative charge, it's gained one, so now it has 10. So all three of these um, two ions and this one atom, they all have the same number of electrons, but they have different numbers of protons. So we can take a look and see, okay, which one's going to be the biggest, which one's going to be the smallest. So let's look at sodium first. Sodium has 11 protons and 10 electrons. What's got more protons than neon? So it should be smaller. It'll be a little bit smaller than neon. Now you may say, well, isn't it in the third energy level? But it's not. It's lost its only th energy level three electron. So now it's valence electrons match those of neons. neon. They're in the second energy level. Now fluorine, um, fluorine has nine protons, 10 electrons as, as fluoride. Um, and so it's only gonna have nine protons. So it's gonna be larger. It doesn't have as much positive charge to pull those close. And so fluorine will be the largest of the three. And so we, whenever we look at atomic radius, we really have to think of the protons and electrons uh, and kind of compare them. In all of this, go back to Coulomb's law, go back to energy levels. Um, those won't steer you wrong. Just remember this Q, that's the effective nuclear charge. Um, the greater the effective nuclear charge, the greater the attractive force. And the greater the energy level, one, two, three, and so forth, the greater that R distance will be. The greater that R is, then the less the attractive force would be. And you can use those two ideas to explain all of these trends. Use the periodic table as a way for you to reason things out and to keep things straight. But whenever you're writing out an answer to why a periodic trend occurs, don't use the periodic table. Stick with Coulomb's law, energy levels, effective nuclear charge. Also remember, we can't use the octet rule. The octet rule itself is a trend that says atoms tend to be the most stable whenever they have eight valence electrons, which is an completely accurate. Um, it's also a trend. We can't use that to explain anything. So um, just keep that in mind. Stick with, stick with what we talked about. Thanks for watching and have a great day.